What's up, house churches? So good to be with you technologically today. Christine and the Tampa fam, hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Michael, Rachel, I miss you guys being in my micro church, but I'm glad you're with good company. Here you're going through the green book, making disciples. You know that melts my heart. Troy, house churches in Orlando. Good to see you guys too. Joel and Jen in Newberry and your families, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be preaching and with you today. So we're a few weeks into our sermon series on the book of James. And if you haven't noticed yet, James really just cuts the crap and gets to the point. He's that friend that isn't going to tell you you look good if you don't, right? If truth is needed, he's going to bring it. So in that same vein, I really want to be raw and real and shoot very straight with you and expose some of the candid moments of the journey of my soul and some of those troubles without a lot of fluff this morning. So we're gonna dive deep into some theological truths that whether you're a Christian or not, whether if you're just alive, you've wrestled with some of these issues. So let's take a look. You stand with me as we read the word of God. We're gonna look at James 1, 16 through 18. And it says this, "'Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. "'Every good and perfect gift is from above, "'coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, "'who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a first fruits of all he created. So Father, I pray that you are going to just speak through this. Let these words come to life. Let your word be unleashed in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, can you say amen? Amen. All right, can you have a seat? Like I said, James doesn't mince words. He says what he means and he means what he says. And so when it comes to God's goodness, he is clear. God is not evil. God does not tempt you. In fact, he's altogether good. He's unmistakably good. He is perfectly good. And then you look around at this jacked up world. <laughs> you look at the hardships that you've had to endure. You look at all of those times where you felt abandoned by God, or you felt abandoned by the people who are supposed to be able to be trusted. There might be some of you that you're even walking around with something inside of you and you're carrying that as a secret burden. And if you're a human, whether you're a cynic or not, you have those moments where you really ask yourself in your heart of hearts, is God as good as the Bible says he is? And this is where James comes in. In verse 16, he bluntly says to his first century readers, which remember are enduring fierce persecution right now for their faith, some of whom have watched their friends and families die. James says, hey, don't be deceived. Our first point today is literally exactly what James just said. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived that God is causing your temptation. Don't be deceived that God is not good. Don't buy into the lie. Just don't do it. See, I think we get deceived in two major ways in my mind. The first way is we get deceived by the enemy. Have you ever had one of those moments where you're thinking a thought and another thought pops in your head that's just foreign but very loud and it says, that's not true. Or you're thinking about somebody and they say, do you really believe that they are being honest with you right now? There are times where, for me personally, I hear that voice in my head, I literally do a double take in the room because I feel like it is so audibly loud in my head. Does anybody ever feel like that? Right? Especially if you're struggling with someone or something or you're going through a trial, that voice comes into our head and it whispers, is God really with you? Is he really good? Is this the doing of a good God? And if there's one good thing about the enemy we face, it's that he is unimaginative. And this is really helpful when you're being tempted to believe his lies. What do I mean by that? I mean, he really only has a few cards to play and getting you to believe this idea that God is not good, that he is not for you is one of his favorites. In fact, this was his primary play, his initial play with humanity. Let's take this back to the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 1, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, did God really say? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Classic move here, because God never said you must not touch it. He didn't say that. But even that little leading distortion began to sow a false narrative in Eve's mind to where she was already twisting the word of the Lord because of the doubt that the enemy put in her mind. That's really interesting, isn't it? Has that ever happened to you? 
Let's continue. Verse 4, he says, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. See, deception from the enemy is always going to try to end with a wedge between the truth of who God is and your belief in that truth. Satan wants to wreck your faith and your trust in God. Let me ask you this. What was God's first command to humanity? Go ahead, discuss that in your house church right now. What was God's first command to humanity? If you said be fruitful and multiply, that is correct. And talk about a good God, can I get an amen? That's a great first command, right? What about the first command regarding eating in the garden? Discuss that. What was the first command God gave humans in the garden when it came to eating fruit? God's first command wasn't to not eat. Genesis 2.16 actually says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. The second command was in Genesis 2.17, which says, don't eat from this one single tree, but everything else is for your delight and your enjoyment. And this is the great deception of the enemy. He will get you to focus on the one thing you can't have and not let you see the countless other things that you can. Our optics will be deceived if we let the enemy dictate the lens we look through. All right, if you didn't say amen to that, I'm going to give you another chance. That was a good line. Our optics will deceive us if we let the enemy dictate the lens we look through. Let's take relationships, for example. Before you get married, what's the one thing you're not supposed to do that Satan tries to tempt you with and convince you that it's okay to have? Sex, right? Intercourse. And when you get married, now sex is something that is sanctified and ordained by God. And the enemy is what? what is the, what's the enemy going to do? Right? He's going to try to get you to be unsatisfied with your sex life, looking for a man or a woman you can't have, even though you have the one thing that you wanted so badly before you got married right there with your spouse at any time. Right? The enemy is always going to try to focus the lens on what you don't have instead of what you do have. And the whisper that comes with this strategy is the whisper that says, maybe God said it's wrong, but I'm not sure he's right in that assessment. And if we're honest with ourselves, Satan has a way of trying to get us to think that God is stingy, that he's holding out on us, that he's not really in it for our good, that if we do it God's way, it's not going to be as fun. And he really doesn't have our best interest in mind. All right, let's go back to the sex before marriage. The lie goes like this. Did God really say wait until you're married? I mean, we love each other, right? Does a legal contract given by the state really dictate the love and the covenant from God? I mean, didn't we already agree to that in our heart? Isn't God the judge of that? And so goes the lies that we drink in and allow ourselves to be drunk with its deception. James says, don't be deceived. Why? Because people are regularly deceived by what? The deception that God is not good and that he's holding out on you for some reason. Now you might say, Matt, I don't really struggle with that. Well, if the enemy can't get you on that side, he's going to swing the pendulum all the way on the other side and try to deceive you with religion. It's interesting that when we read the Gospels and we see Jesus going toe-to-toe -to -toe with religious Pharisees and the scribes and the rulers of the day, have you noticed that we never see ourselves as those religious wrongdoers? Like whenever I read the Gospels, I always see myself as in Jesus's gospel disciple posse, right? I always see myself in vision, and I envision myself as kind of being the guy next to Jesus when he drops some theological truth or he heals somebody on the Sabbath and all the Pharisees get all upset. I see like me, Peter, James, and John being like, oh, you got God. Don't try to get Jesus, son. He's the son of God. Get out of here, Pharisee. Come on, Jesus, let's go. You know, I mean, I have this whole like thing in my mind where I see myself on Jesus's side. The challenge with us always putting ourselves in the disciples camp is I would argue that more than half the time, we probably align more with the people that Jesus is rebuking than the ones he's not. Because religion is deceptive. Religion is when we focus on how good we are, how squeaky clean we are, when we think we have all the right beliefs and we're always doing the right thing. We think things like, how can believers not see the scripture? It's so clear that this is the truth and they're over there getting, they're all mixed up with that. Da, da, da. And, and the problem is that the same believers you're trying to push off on are doing the same thing with you, but with another set of scriptures and the things that you're not doing yourself. See, the problem is when we start thinking this way, we will be led astray. 
when we follow the rules, we get all haughty totty because we're starting to do stuff that we've never done before. This is the best is when somebody just starts fasting for the very first time or they start Sabbathing and they've done it like once, they get very aware of all their friends that aren't doing those things. They're like, wow, that guy's never fasted. Hey, look at this guy. I mean, can you get some self-control, please? Can you believe this guy? I mean, we get all judgmental because they're doing something or they're not doing something that we just started doing like last week. <laughs> we get deceived. Religion will deceive you. And when we settle for religion, we miss out on the abundant life that Jesus is offering. And we get deceived that doing good and looking good is the reward for following Jesus. And this is what Jesus is calling out in the Pharisees. Newsflash, you're probably a Pharisee. Oh, Matt, I don't know. That's offensive. No, no, you probably are. At least part of your heart is. And we have to be aware enough and not deceived enough to know that that's probably the reality. So Jesus, help us figure that out. Because religion will deceive you into thinking that being good is the end goal and that the pursuit of your legalistic endeavors will constrain you like chains that slowly tighten around your soul, sucking the breath out of your lungs. Until there's nothing left. Don't be deceived. Why? Because every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In short, God is good. Friends, I don't know how you're walking into the house church you're in this morning, but I want to give you some of the very best news that you will ever hear. God is good, and every good thing comes from Him. We know this based on his character, based on his word, based on his spirit, that he is good. God is good, and he shares that goodness with us. So why do we doubt this? I think it's because everything else in our world tells us otherwise. The world looks like it's falling apart. People stab us in the back. I mean, what's going on in our country right now? It's hard not to tip the scales heavily into cynicism and really think, Lord, can anybody be good? God, are you even good in this moment? See, cynicism is the coping mechanism of earth. We aren't born with cynicism, but the world forces us to use it as a coping mechanism just to justify this jacked up fallen world that we live in. We struggle with cynicism, and the problem is when we struggle with cynicism, it bleeds into our relationship with God and what we believe in him and whether, whether or not we really believe what he says and whether or not we really believe that he is good. Some of us have to reconstruct everything we see and we know to actually believe the fundamental truth that God is actually good. But friends, this is the heart of discipleship. Discipleship is relearning how to live your life in the ways, the truth, and the reality of Jesus. Man, you may have a terrible past, and you may have had a horrible earthly father that treated you so poorly. And if that's the case, I am so sorry for that. That is not how it should be. But God is a good God, and he wants you to relearn what it means to have a father who is good and gives good gifts. Now, some of you have experience in the bank. You could say, I know, Matt. I can give you testimony after testimony. But there are some of us who don't have that same experience. And the beauty is, like I've said earlier, like that God gives us his character reference in his word. And one of the things that he says in James 1, 16 and 17, he says, every good and perfect gift is from him. But what does that exactly mean? Let's break that down a bit, okay? We're going to start with the word perfect. That word perfect is the Greek for teleon. It means perfect, complete in all its parts, full grown, going through the necessary stages to reach the end goal, especially of the completeness in Christian character. See, the goodness of God is manifested often in good gifts that lead you to completion. But these come down from our Heavenly Father who does not change. He does not shift like shadows. He does not do one thing one moment and then change and do something else at another. No, He's constant in His goodness. Even when it feels like things are falling apart around you and your world is crumbling, He is still good. And He will use what's going on around you for your good, even when it doesn't feel like it. Now, some of you know, but some of you might not since I'm not with you in Tampa or Orlando or Newberry, and it's been a minute since I preached, but um, my eight-year-old daughter, Alethea, has spina bifida, and she also has epilepsy. And we've had some really bad seasons, y'all. I'm not even going to lie to you about that. Um, we're in a good season right now, thank God. I mean, we, it's been over 100 days, and we haven't had a seizure, and, and you really 
don't understand what that means for our family. We are so thankful to God for that. But it doesn't mean that everything's perfect either. So we put our kids down around 7, 7.30 every night. <laughs> Pause, parents, can I get an amen for that? I mean, that's like epically awesome that my eight-year-old still goes down at 7.30. But anyways, uh, when we put our children down, I put my four-year-old Adelaide down. And if I'm putting Adelaide down, Tracy puts Alethea or vice versa. And one of us actually goes to bed with Allie and we sit in there for about an hour to watch her fall asleep. The reason we do that is because that hour right after she falls asleep is when she's most vulnerable uh, to the seizure activity. And, and Allie's seizures aren't like 10 seconds or two minutes. Her seizures actually don't stop. Unless we medically intervene with medicine, they will not stop. I mean, I remember when she was two, her first seizure went on for an hour and a half, probably one of the most terrifying moments of my life. And so if we're not there to stop it quickly, it can escalate very rapidly. And so we're there and honestly, like we watch her go to sleep and a lot of nights her body will jerk and move. And so we're just sitting over there and we're just praying over her and we're asking the Lord to not let this develop into a full-blown seizure. I'll be honest with you guys, as a dad, that's really hard to watch almost every night. You know, I'm not sure what's going on in your life, but I bet there's some moments that happen or a recurrent moment like this one in my life that gives, gives you pause to doubt the goodness of God, if we're just going to be real this morning. It could be abuse in your past. You know, it could be something that happened or is happening to your child. It could just be the way that our world is right now in 2020 that's affecting you. Trust me, there's always something in our life that will seem to run counter to the assertion that God is good. Or at least act as a moment where you hear that whisper, did God really say that he would be good to you? Or the enemy just speaks that in your ear. And even though I can't directly see how things like in my life line up with God's goodness or how this incorporates with every good and perfect gift, this is where faith has to kick in and supersede my natural understanding of the things around me. See, we all like to quote verses like Proverbs 3, 5. That's a good like token Christianese verse where it says, you know, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. But listen, I can't lean on my own understanding in this situation with Allie or else I'm going to be blanketed in despair. But when I look at the goodness of God, what the word says about God, what the word says about healing. I'm renewed with hope, with passion, with a prayer, uh, a prayerful vigor that really is asking and believing the Lord to do what he says he's going to do and heal her body and bring her out of the adverse responses of this seizure activity. Because friends, don't miss this, okay? We can't let our situation dictate how we view our God. We have to let our God dictate how we view our situation. I'm telling you, if you get nothing else from this, write that down, believe it, and it will change your life. And I say that out of experience, watching my baby go through surgery after surgery, brain surgery, foot surgery, having her go through seizures and all this stuff. It's, I know it's not easy. And I know it's easy to fall in the temptation of that little voice in my head that says, bro, give up the hoax. He isn't that good. If he was, this wouldn't have happened. But this is where the word illuminates God's goodness and gives us history of who God is, like I said before, and the, what his character says about him. Don't be deceived, church. God is good because you can trust him. Why? Because you and I, we got history, Lord. You might have history with God. But even if you don't have a personal history yet, you still have his history that goes back for thousands of years of his faithfulness and his goodness to his people and how he always comes through. And I don't think I'm overstating this. See, when I personally committed to memorizing scripture about my circumstance, it helped me not lose my faith in some of the most trying times of my life. You know, I get it. I get it now. When people say they walked away from their faith when they went through a hard time, especially when it has to do with your kids or your family, I get it. But man, memorizing scripture was an amazing key because I started to see the reality of what was going on with Allie. And I was like, Lord, this isn't what I see here. What the heck is going on, Lord? Why is this not resolving itself? Why is there not healing? Uh, it, just, it just nagged at my soul every single day. And when I started to memorize scripture, it started to illuminate the actual reality of God where I could believe that, I could put my faith in that, I could put my hope in that, and then I could take these two, and I now have a choice. What am I going to believe? Am I going to believe what I see or am I going to believe who God is and what his word says? And, and let me just be really clear here. 
Memorizing scripture is not a magic pill that I took and then, oh, everything's great and better. No, what it did though is it gave me a choice. It gave me the choice to believe what God said and that supersede what I am seeing. And these are the perfect gifts that one brings to maturity and completion, like James says in 1 verses 2 and 3. Right? It gives me the choice. Am I going to believe the seizure profile, which is like one of the worst that she can have, Lennox Gestalt syndrome? Am I going to believe that that's going to overtake her? Or am I, I going to believe that God's going to heal her and bring her out of this and have a story and a testimony and a victory on the other side? And I believe the latter. I believe that. But I have to make that choice every morning. This isn't a one-time belief. This is a every morning, every night when I'm putting her to bed and I see that little body jerk, I have to believe what the scripture says. And when I've memorized that scripture and I hit it in my heart, I could actually say, yes, God, I believe that and I'm choosing life. I'm choosing this reality. I'm choosing to believe what the scriptures say about you, your disposition towards me, the disposition he has towards you, and that he is good. Don't be deceived. God is good because we can trust him. We can trust every perfect gift. Every teleon gift is for our benefit. But here's the beauty. It's not just that they're perfect gifts. It's good and perfect gifts. And looking at the breadth of scripture from Genesis in the garden to Revelation, the ultimate good gift that God gave us was his presence. Don't be deceived. God is good because you can trust him and because he is with you. He's with you. You know, I was out at Fuller Seminary, man, about 15 years ago, getting my master's there. Uh, and one of my friends took a class called Grief, Death, and Dying. I was like, whoa, that sounds like a crazy class. And I was really curious to see what, it's a theology class. I was curious to see what the end result was. So I asked my friend Katie, who took the class, I said, Katie, so, so you went through all this. What's the deal? She said, you know what? We went through all these scriptures. We went through all these theological points, some big philosophical questions. She said, you know what really at the end of it people need? I said, what? I said, people just need you to be there. They don't need your answers. They don't need your advice. They just need you to be with them. As I look back at some of the hardest moments of my life, the memories I cherished the most were when people were simply there when I needed them the most. And God knows this. And that's why he said, I will be with you. You know, almost every night, Aletheia calls out, usually between like 9 and 11 p.m. She'll just cry, Mommy, Daddy! Mommy! And she'll get real kind of high-pitched, and every night we'll go in there, and I'll put my hand on her, or Tracy will, and we'll simply repeat this phrase, I'm here, baby. You're safe. I'm here. You're safe. She'll usually acknowledge that and then go back to sleep. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to continue to do that until even her subconscious parts of her mind and her soul believe it and are at peace. I'm here. You're safe. See, Jesus didn't tell us life would be easy. His idea and concept of good is countercultural to the world's idea that we're going to win the lottery and everything's going to be great. He doesn't say everything's going to be great. He says, in this world, you will have troubles. You will have trial. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Friends, Jesus is saying, just like he said to the persecuted believers that were reading this first book of James as it was being circulated through oral tradition and papyrus papers 2,000 years ago as their bodies were being attacked, he said, I'm here. You're safe in my presence. The people who can hurt your body cannot hurt your soul. In the midst of your trials, I'm here. You're safe. When someone attacks your character at work, I'm here. You're safe. In your darkest hour, Jesus says, I am here. You're safe. Things will be made right. Things will be made new. And this will work out for your good, despite how challenging that feels sometimes. See, God has a way of taking very dark times and circumstances and working it out for your good. Am I saying that? I'm not saying that God is the author of the darkness. God is not the author of your pain or your hurt. No, but the way we know it's the Lord is that there's no darkness in it. He's the father of light, and that light cannot be stopped by darkness. In fact, he can infuse that light into darkness and somehow turn these crazy, hurtful, painful situations and use them for your good, as crazy as that is sometimes. Church, don't be deceived. God is good because you can trust him and because he's with you. Verse 18 says, this is the truth that we were birthed into when we started following 
Jesus. So the real question this morning is, what optics are you going to choose to look through? This is the question James was asking those persecuted Christians that he was initially writing this letter to. Are they really going to believe that God has abandoned them in their persecution? That he has left them to be consumed by their enemies? That he has taken his hand of protection off of them to be devoured by the Roman opposition? No. Or are they going to believe that God is good and that every good and perfect gift is from God? Even in the midst of the most severe trial of their life, God can still be good. He can still be with them. He can still be trusted. We might not understand it, and God only knows I would do things differently if I was in charge, but I am not. But he is, and he's good. We need to trust him who has shown us that he's willing to give everything for us. You see, we serve a God who gave up the ultimate goodness so that we could experience and see and taste his goodness. Parents, don't let the familiarity of the gospel inhibit your parental understanding of the fact that the father gave up his son. Think about it. Would you give up your child for a criminal who may or may not repent? If I'm honest with y'all, if I'm raw with y'all this morning, I wouldn't. Heck no. That's my baby. He allowed Jesus to bear the weight of all of our wrongdoings and take our place so that we could be grafted into his family by liberating us from the sin and punishment we rightly deserve. This was the ultimate act of goodness. If you can't believe God is good, look to the cross and see the goodness that is there. So today as we close out, I want you to think through and maybe discuss the following questions in your house church. So think about it and then maybe have some time for conversation afterwards. The first question is this, what causes you to doubt the goodness of God? What situations or experience cause you to doubt his goodness? That's a, that's a pretty deep question, but I want you to go there. What causes you to doubt the goodness of God? The second question is, what are some ways that you could or have moved past those doubts and started truly and fully believing that God is good? I'll say it again. What are some of the ways that you could or have moved past the doubts and started truly and fully believing that he is good? Because God's goodness is a fundamental theological truth that liberates us to believe and have faith when naturally we don't have the capacity or bandwidth to do so. So talk through it, discuss it, and be freed by this truth and this reality. Let me pray. God, we're just so thankful that you are good, that you are for us, that every good and perfect gift is from you. Even the hard times in our life, you turn that into good for us. Jesus, there's no one like you. There's no one like you. And we thank you for all of these things. We love you, God. We thank you and we pray these in the strong and good name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Have a good rest of your day.